Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're doing Roger Williams this morning, the founder of Rhode Island. And um, I just mentioned, somebody uh, uh, already mentioned my, my introductory line here, that uh, this nice drawing of Roger Williams um, uh, probably doesn't look anything like him. Uh, we don't know what Roger Williams looked like because there was no, uh, there's no uh, existing painting or drawing of him uh, from when he, from his days of uh, being on this earth. So one thing we do know is that uh, he did not like uh, men wearing long hair. Virtually every description of him, uh, any, any drawing of him or any statue of him, uh, we'll have him with long hair. But of course, we don't really know what long means to, uh, to him. Um, so anyway, uh, it's, this is as good as anything we, we could have, I suppose. But before I get into Roger Williams, what did I forget from last week? Um, John Winthrop. Actually, there's a couple of things I need to uh, make a correction. Uh, somebody had asked uh, how old he was when he died. I said 61. He was 60, not 61. My, yeah, I know, way off. Well, the, the, the reason that I said 61 was because I was looking at uh, his, his birthday uh, was in uh, 1588. But that was the old calendar. The old calendar, uh, the end of the year was March 25th. And so January was still 1588, the way they counted it back then. For our purposes, it was 1590, uh, 1589. So that's, that's what messed me up. Well, I'm um, so glad you told us. Yeah, I know, uh, you're on edge there. Um, the other thing that I left out that I really wanted to mention was that on his deathbed, he was governor still at that time. And um, uh, Dudley, his uh, deputy governor, had uh, come to him. He was dying on his deathbed, but he was still governor. And he was presented a paper saying, uh, this person needs to be banished from our colony and we need you to sign this. And John Winthrop said, no, I've done enough of that. I'm not going to do this. He was not going to sign the banishment papers uh, for whoever it was that needed to be banished. So that was, that's kind of his legacy that he would much rather be a person of compassion than on his deathbed sign the papers for somebody being banished. So, Roger Williams, our bibliography. Um, something that I, I found out back in my younger years in college when I was studying John Winthrop, I was looking at the bibliography uh, available at the time for John Winthrop, and there were very few biographies. I looked at the list of biographies for Roger Williams, and I found there were dozens and dozens of them. And I did not understand why that would be. Why would there be so many biographies of Roger Williams and so few of John Winthrop? Well, we're going to explain that today. Um, Roger Williams, uh, became an internationally famous person. Uh, not so much today, but um, he became uh, something of a, a superstar for some groups of people. Of course, it was long after he died, but um, he became uh, a hero to many people. So this first one, Edwin uh, Gausta, Roger Williams. This is a, a nice little introduction if you wanted something short and sweet. Uh, it was written probably for uh, either middle school kids or high school kids. Uh, so it was, it's nicely done, straightforward, to the point, uh, not a lot of rambling, uh, 
easy to get through. Uh, this next one, Edmund S. Morgan. For those of you who remember last week, uh, Morgan wrote my favorite biography of John Winthrop, uh, The Puritan Dilemma. This one um, is not exactly a biography. It's more an explanation as to the thought of Roger Williams. He explains church and state, uh, what were uh, Roger Williams' beliefs in that regard. Cyclone Covey. How do you like that for a name? Who would name their kids Cyclone? They're asking for trouble. Yeah, yeah. Well, apparently Cyclone became uh, a scholar. So, whatever. The Gentle Radical, Roger Williams. Um, this was nicely done. Uh, I, I would put this more in the category of uh, Roger Williams, his life and times, because he explains a lot of things about what was going on around him uh, in addition to his life um, itself. So, um, a good read, uh, to me is a little bit long, uh, the, the, the edition that I have has rather small print, so it's a lot longer than the uh, 273 pages that, uh, of the book. Uh, the next one, along the same lines, uh, Roger Williams and the Creation of the American Soul. Uh, I really enjoyed this one. Again, it's kind of like the life and times of Roger Williams <clears throat> instead of just Roger Williams, because again, it explains a lot of things that were going on in the colonies and in England at the time. So um, it's not a bad thing. This one, for me, you know, it's 464 pages, but it seemed about the same length as the Cyclone Covey book. Um, but I, I enjoyed this one a little bit better, just an easier style, I think, uh, than the uh, earlier one. But these two are like the main biographies that I would go for if you're really into learning about Roger Williams. The next one, Perry Miller, Roger Williams, his contribution to the American tradition. If you are at all uh, into the scholarship of Puritan uh, America, you would know the name of Perry Miller. He wrote, uh, he was like uh, <coughs> the most famous scholar of Puritan thought. Not so much Puritan history, although he's certainly uh, very deeply into that, but he wrote several books on uh, the, the thought, the mind, the Puritan mind in America. Uh, so, very great scholar, mostly back in the, in the 30s and 40s uh, were his writings. Um, this book in particular is not exactly a biography, but it's more about his thoughts and it goes back and forth between his commentary and long excerpts of Roger Williams' writings. Erwin um, Polishuk, Roger Williams, John Cotton, and Religious Freedom. Again, this is a commentary on the writings of Roger Williams, uh, who had a, somewhat of a feud uh, between he and John Cotton, arguing over religious liberty. And finally, Roger Williams, A Key to the Language of America. This is a, a fascinating book. Um, probably the only book, the only writings of Roger Williams that I could recommend that somebody read. Um, I'm gonna talk about in a little bit uh, the writings of Roger Williams. He's almost uh, unreadable. He's so uh, long-winded and tedious. What's the date on it? 1643. That's when the book came out. That's not what the book that I have. I, I generally like to, I generally like to give the original publishing date when I put these up. Uh, but yeah, he published it in 1643. But this is, like I said, um, an excellent book. Uh, it is, uh, when it came out, it was a big hit. 
because so many people wanted to learn about the Native American languages, or more specifically, they wanted to learn about Native Americans. Um, and for those who wanted to really work at it, you could learn the Native American uh, Narragansett language uh, from this book. But he also has many uh, smaller quotes and uh, observations about uh, the natives in his that he knows in the book. So it, it, for that, for me, that's what makes it interesting. Uh, learning the Native American language is kind of beyond my capability or, or desire at this point, but um, the observations that he makes are, are really interesting. Okay, <clears throat> born December 21st, 1603, middle class uh, merchant Taylor was his father, uh, James Williams and wife Alice. He received an, uh, an education far beyond what he really should have expected. Uh, he was very fortunate in that um, he was tutored by Sir Edward Cook. Does that name sound familiar to anybody? Yeah, <laughs> wrong Cook. <laughs> Sir Edward Cook is considered to be one of the greatest legal minds in British history. And he happened to live near the Williams family and he uh, became a tutor for Roger Williams. And because of that connection, it made uh, other connections possible. So he got, he received a wonderful education about as good as one might get in England at the time. And uh, being a very bright young man, he uh, exhibited a great facility for languages. He learned Hebrew, Greek, Dutch, uh, Latin, and French as a fairly young man. And he graduated from Pembroke College in Cambridge, 1627, and received his divinity degree. And promptly, uh, became a Puritan. Um, where and when he uh, joined the Puritan movement, we're not really sure, uh, but uh, he became uh, an ardent uh, Puritan as, as much as any of them, and then more so as time went on. Um, he received his holy orders, 1629, and he had uh, probably the best cush job that any chaplain could hope for, uh, working as the private chaplain for a very wealthy man, wealthy family, um, where basically you are just uh, taking care of uh, his spiritual needs, or the family's spiritual needs, and the servants, and so on, uh, and living uh, very nicely. Um, uh, he married one of the maids uh, of the uh, household, 1629, but he caught the, the fever of uh, Puritanism, and he saw that uh, there is a great movement throughout the country and a group of people who were going to the New World, and he decided he had to join them because uh, God uh, felt, or God called him to the ministry. God, God called him to purify the evils of the church and join this movement in doing that. And when he got to the New World, he was already fairly known uh, amongst the, uh, the leadership. Uh, John Winthrop probably knew him from England and uh, knew him to be a very bright, uh, up-and-coming young man, and offered him immediately a position uh, in the Boston church. And Roger Williams declined, because Roger Williams was already going past uh, what the Puritans believed. He was becoming more pure than the Puritans. <laughs> and when they offered him the position, he said, well, have you uh, separated yourselves from the evils of the Church of England? And they said, no, we're going to work 
to purify the Church of England. And he said, no, the Church of England is hopeless. You need to repent of the evil that you have committed in associating yourself with that church, which is no true church at all. And they said, no, you're going too far. <clears throat> and so he decided to go up to Salem um, and try to convince them of the rightness of his position and separate from the Church of England. And that almost worked. But when they heard about it in Boston, they made sure that the Salem, the people of Salem, were not going to take in this radical. So he went to Plymouth. After all, Plymouth, you have separatists already. They had separated themselves from the evils of the Anglican Church. So he was there for a couple of years, and that seemed to uh, be what he wanted until he went past them as well. He became more pure than the separatists. We don't know exactly what the problem was. Uh, we only know that uh, William Bradford had mentioned that uh, this godly young man had some unsettling opinions. And so he left them, went back again to Salem to see if that could work. And for a time it did. Salem actually accepted him. And and he was going to be their pastor. They were in desperate need of a pastor at the time, which explains some of that because uh, their pastor uh, had died or was, was dying. And so uh, they, they wanted him because he was a very charming young man. He was the type of guy that uh, uh, the personality uh, of someone, uh, would he would just draw people to himself. Uh, people loved his personality. He lo they loved his preaching. Um, so he was great in that sense. Uh, but that created problems in Boston. They did not want this young radical uh, radicalizing the Salem church. So there was a debate that went on for some time. Um, and so uh, part of the problem, of course, was not just that he wanted... Uh, them to be separate, uh, he was offering a whole range of laws that needed to be changed. One of which uh, was that all religious laws, all laws that pertain to conscience, should be done away with. Working on the Sabbath, that is a religious idea. Roger Williams said, you should not punish people uh, for uh, working on the Sabbath because that's, that's a religious idea. You should not um, punish people for uh, using the Lord's name in vain. Blasphemy. That is not something that the civil authorities should deal with. That is a church issue. You can excommunicate somebody, uh, but you should not punish them with the civil law. Also, the king, and I mentioned this last week when I talked about Roger Williams, uh, the king should also repent of his sin of granting uh, the charter for Massachusetts. The king has no right to grant the land that, owns, that the Indians own to Englishmen. We need to uh, talk to the king, tell him to repent, I'm sure that would go over really well. <laughs> and, um, and we need to renounce the charter. And, we, and once that is done, then we can start anew and get permission from the natives uh, for this land. And that can be done. Uh, but it certainly was not going to be done uh, to the king. So these are the kind of the radical things that Roger Williams was, was insisting upon. And so uh, he was put on trial. Uh, he, was, he was convicted, of course, for basically uh, being uh, a uh, rebellion against the king would probably be the, the, uh, the charge that would stick. So anyway, yeah. so he was banished. But at the time, 
It was winter when uh, the uh, when the decision came down, and so he was given several weeks to wait for spring before he was banished. But he was going to be sent back to England. That was the plan. John John Winthrop, uh, still his friend, even though he voted to have him banished, still felt compassion for him. And the, uh, the deal was, Roger Williams, you can stay here in Boston. You can stay among us until the springtime, as long as you don't spread your radical views to anybody. If you do, then you're going to be kicked out immediately. Well, he couldn't keep his mouth shut. <laughs> and they found out he was going to... Uh, be evicted. He was going to be sent back to England on the next ship. John Winthrop warned him ahead of time and said, uh, we, are, we found out that you've been uh, promoting your ideas and uh, you will be banished. You'll be sent, you and your family, uh, sent to England in the next ship. So I advise you, uh, you know, do what you think is best. And so Roger Williams, uh, before the constables showed up, uh, he took off in the middle of winter uh, to find a place that he could call home. So in January of 1636, uh, he took off with one uh, servant and for the next 13 weeks or so, uh, we don't have any details but we know it must have been harrowing uh, off on his own. Uh, spent some time with the Native Americans with whom uh, he had made friends uh, while he was in Plymouth. The two years he was there, uh, he made uh, very good friends with the local natives. And so he had connections. But it was still very difficult for several weeks, even months, uh, on his own. and. As time went on, some more of his followers joined him, but still very difficult. Um, but then he found the place that he wanted to settle, uh, and it was in the Narragansett uh, Indian Territory, and having already made friends with uh, Canonicus, the head chief, uh, he requested that uh, he could, if he could buy land from them and uh, the chief, taking a great liking to Roger Williams, uh, said, you can have it for free. Of course, uh, this also involved uh, gratuities. Uh, you do not go to an Indian tribe making friends without uh, exchanging gifts. That was uh, accepted, that was expected. And so uh, Roger Williams would frequently uh, give gifts gratuities to Canonicus and other Native Americans uh, in keeping in their good graces. So there's a number of paintings of Roger Williams uh, coming to uh, the site where he was setting up his colony and I, I picked out the two of them that I liked the best. So here's Roger Williams. Um, this, this scene here, actually both of them, he had to cross a river. The first site that he uh, landed and started to settle uh, actually turned out to be part of Plymouth Colony. And even though he planted his fields of corn, uh, representatives from Plymouth came and said, uh, excuse me, uh, you're setting up your colony on our territory. Uh, we don't want to cause you any trouble. Uh, we consider you a friend, but you can't settle here. So all he really had to do is cross the river and settle there. And that's what he did. And that's what this scene depicts. So very shortly, he had seven or eight families um, increasing uh, monthly, you might say. Uh, they established uh, their farming communities. Uh, they established a church. Uh, and at this point, Roger Williams becomes a Baptist. The evolution of his thought 
um, and being ex exposed to a number of different sects coming to America, uh, he really liked the Baptists because uh, it made more sense for a an adult to be baptized rather than a child. I could not find uh, if he decided to go with immersion rather than sprinkling. And I'm kind of frustrated with that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, the biographies that I have always mention it seemed to him to be a superstition to uh, baptize a baby that has no conception of what's going on. This should be an adult decision. Joining the church is an adult decision. Becoming a follower of Christianity is an adult decision. Why would you do that to an infant? It, uh, it doesn't make any sense to him. So he became a Baptist and organized uh, the church around uh, the ideas of uh, getting rid of the superstitions, as he saw it, of the Catholic Church especially, but the Anglican Church as well, and, doing, and having a complete separation of religious laws as opposed to civil laws. And more and more people were joining him, as I said, and setting up new towns uh, in the area. So, Anne Hutchinson, uh, as I mentioned last week, she, is, she was banished from, uh, from Boston and the Massachusetts colony. She decided to join Roger Williams as well. Um, she was there for a couple of years, I'm not sure exactly the length of time, but a few years, and, um, and decided that wasn't right for her either, so she moved on. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned also, uh, I believe it was five years after she was banished from Massachusetts, uh, she was caught up in an Indian raid in the Dutch colony, and uh, she and most of her family were killed. So anyway, um, we now have Portsmouth, in addition to um, Providence, and Newport and Warwick are established as well. Um, one of the great things about Roger Williams was his compassion for the Native Americans. As I said, uh, he was not going to take any land that they didn't give him or sell to him, and he was going to treat them with the compassion that he believed they deserved. Uh, he was not going to uh, have a separate law for them and for Englishmen. Um, but anyway, uh, his, his comment on the land that he bought from them, or he received from them, was that it was bought with love. Uh, no amount of money or goods could have gotten the lands that I got from them, but uh, they gave it freely uh, out of love. And he became, uh, since he was so good with languages, uh, he learned uh, the Narragansett Algonquin language along with uh, several of the dialects in the area and became a very important uh, translator for the Indians. And he wrote this marvelous book, A Key to the Language of America. And as, as I've mentioned in my introduction, uh, it's a wonderful book. I mean, if you wanted to learn the language, you could. Um, but just on every page, <laughs> there are observations that are uh, usually quite fascinating. And I'm going to quote a few. So uh, his observations, obscure persons in the Narragansett tribe um, often have no names. Isn't that something? There are people in their tribe who do not have a name. They are the, uh, the lower sorts of people as they would consider them. Uh, but uh, if you are addressing such a person, you just say you or he or she, uh, you just use pronouns because they didn't have names. <coughs> they abhor to name the dead especially if it was a great person, 
who died, and if another person happened to have that name, they would have to change it. That name is now dead. No one else can use it. And it was not to be spoken. The name is gone. They are punctual in their promises of keeping time. No one has a watch or a clock, but they kept time very accurately just by watching the sun. Sometimes they have charged me with a lie for not punctually keeping time, though I was hindered. Isn't that something? You were supposed to be here at such and such a time and you didn't show up. Well, how do you even know it's that time? Well, look at the sun. Can't you tell? <laughs> I've known many of them run uh, between four score or a hundred miles in a summer's day. Everybody was a good runner back in those days. If you are a uh, pre-industrial society, uh, if you're pre-agricultural society, especially, uh, you are a good runner. Everybody is good at running because it was necessary, not just for hunting, but for traveling long distances. And so I, I cut this uh, quote off, but he goes on and says that, um, so they, they can run 100 miles in a, a summer's day, and a couple days later they can run the 100 miles back with no trouble. <laughs> a little house which their women live apart in uh, four, five, or six days in the time of their monthly sickness. Women are to be kept separate during their menstrual period. No man was to go anywhere near a woman. And this is something that you find very common in many uh, Native American tribes, that women being near a woman uh, was absolutely taboo when she was on her period, as if you were to catch some awful sickness if you were near her, especially if you touched her. Their affections for their children are very strong, which makes the children saucy, bold, and undutiful. Again, this is something that uh, is almost universal among Native American tribes, that uh, uh, so many people observe that they absolutely adored their children loved them dearly, and almost never disciplined them. And Roger Williams also in the book mentions a time where he was visiting a family and uh, the father of the family uh, was going to get Roger Williams a drink of water. He asked if he was thirsty. Yes, I'm, I'm thirsty. And he said to his son, uh, could you go get Roger Williams uh, a drink of water? And the son said, no, I'm not going to do that very rudely. And Roger Williams is sitting there thinking, what in the world's going on here? Why is this kid such a, a brat to his father? And Roger Williams says to the father, uh, you know what, what you need to do is get a stick and beat that kid. <laughs> and the father's like, yeah, I, I'm not really sure, but yeah, sure, okay. So the father got a stick and hit his son with it. And um, it didn't really accomplish anything. And the father felt terrible and probably would never do that again. But uh, yeah, it was a, a, a interesting observation uh, that many uh, white people had, had um, amongst the Native Americans. Whoever trades with them has need of wisdom, patience, and faithfulness. For they often say, you lie or you deceive me. They were very sharp traders, frequently, uh, and in his dealings with the Native Americans, in trading with them, um, if this is just a business transaction, this is not friends uh, giving gifts back and forth, uh, you've got to be on your toes, you've got to be very sharp. And uh, if you borrow, or if they borrow something from you, an amount of uh, money or something of value and promise to give it back. Um, sometimes that was very difficult. Uh, he felt that uh, many Native Americans, once they borrowed something, uh, sometimes they assumed that uh, they didn't need to pay it back or didn't think much of paying it back. And uh, Roger Williams would go great lengths and sometimes 
uh, many years before he would get uh, the loan back again. So here is a drawing that you will not see very often. Here is a white man who's kind of crouching uh, below a Native American. This is uh, Williams uh, begging for Canonicus to take him in uh, so he could start this colony and Canonicus pointing out this is the territory that you can have. And once he established himself in uh, Rhode Island, he became uh, something of a diplomat because everybody knew that he was a good friend of the natives, especially the Narragansetts. Um, the governor of Massachusetts uh, at the time, uh, Sir Henry Vane, pleaded with Williams to try to convince Canonicus not to join with the Pequots. Last week I talked about the Pequot War with um, between mainly Massachusetts, but really all of the colonies uh, versus the Pequot tribe, who was a very aggressive uh, tribe at the time. Uh, they sent to, to Roger Williams, who had been warning them that uh, the Pequots were becoming more and more aggressive and talking about war and wanting to uh, side up with the Narragansetts. If the Pequots and the Narragansetts uh, made a treaty and were to attack the settlements, uh, it would go very badly. Um, many, many people would be killed, many white people. And so they asked Roger Williams to use his influence with the Narragansetts to keep that from happening. Uh, once he got that message, uh, even though he was very ill, it was stormy out, he rode uh, rode in his canoe uh, 30 miles in a storm to kind of head this off. And he was there once he got to uh, the village and he was talking with the chiefs. The Pequots were there also, and they were trying to get the Narragansetts to side with them against the whites. And Roger Williams prevailed. Uh, the Narragansetts, because of their friendship with him, sided with uh, the white Englishmen instead of the Pequots. They probably didn't much like the Pequots anyway because they were an up-and-coming kind of an aggressive tribe and so they were on the fence to begin with uh, not really sure whether they could trust the Pequots but it is a very fortunate thing for the colonists that the two tribes did not uh, sign a treaty and uh, go to war against them. <clears throat> So here's Williams talking with uh, the Narragansett tribes along with the Pequots. So as I said, he decided to become a Baptist, started the first Baptist church of Rhode Island. And this church is only for believers. Any form of worship, according to Roger Williams, uh, is only for believers. And so if you are not converted and converted in the way that we want you to be in, a, in not just a member of a church because you were baptized as a child, but if you are um, a true believer, then you can jo uh, join the church. Uh, you can have communion, you can be baptized, all of that stuff. Um, but if you are not a truly converted person, you are not welcome in this church. You cannot come in because it's only for believers. If uh, you come across someone who can preach to you or, or explain to you uh, what Christianity is all about and you have your conversion, only then can you go to church. So uh, he became so extreme in this that he said, that if you uh, say you are the head of your family, you're the father, and you're sitting at your table, and either your wife or maybe your children are not yet converted, you cannot say grace over the food that you're about to eat with them present, because that is an act of worship that's only for believers. 
This is the extremes that Roger Williams has uh, come to, that uh, almost nobody uh, could follow him. There's Williams. And yet, he has not yet gone far enough. He goes further. He could not find, uh, as he went deeper and deeper into his theological uh, black hole, uh, he could not find that any church was pure enough. After all, uh, when Jesus uh, lived on the earth and he promoted, his, he promoted Christianity and the apostles after him promoted Christianity, but back in the fourth century with Constantine the Great, who made Christianity not only legal, but promoted it, he said that's what really killed the church back in the fourth century. And we haven't had a church since then. Any minister of the gospel had to have been chosen by Jesus himself or one of the apostles that Jesus had chosen. So there should be an apostle uh, around to choose uh, the ministers of the church. Well, that ended in the fourth century, as he said. And so uh, there has been no true church since then. And so uh, really, we don't have a church. You can be a believer and you can uh, promote Christianity and you can uh, convert people but anything you consider uh, an organized church just is not going to be a church. Uh, Roger Williams at one time had considered himself uh, to be a missionary to the Indians and he wanted to bring Christianity to the poor heathen. The more he got to know the Native Americans, the more he thought, you know, I, I don't think I want to anymore. Uh, they have their beliefs and I, I would feel terrible if I tried to convince them uh, to become Christian and they not really understand it, yet accept what they think is Christianity. And then I have created a false sense of security for these poor Native Americans. So he stopped uh, preaching to the Indians too. He did not discourage others from their pursuit of uh, Christianity and, and promoting their churches. He did not want to do that. Uh, he believed, essentially, the Puritans had it right, or about as right as they could be. Uh, the Puritans in Massachusetts, uh, he had uh, s some disagreements with, of course, but uh, he did not consider them uh, unchristian. So that's how far he would go. Now, he had issues with Rhode Island. He needed to establish it as a colony. Just because he got the Native Americans' permission to start the colony didn't mean that uh, he wasn't going to be taken over by Massachusetts or even Plymouth. Someone with a legal uh, standing could have very easily taken the lands from him. So he went to England to secure a charter. And when he got there, uh, he had just published his work, A Key to the Language of America, which made him very popular in England. People loved that book. They loved the observations that he made, and some of them even tried to learn the language. Um, so that helped him tremendously in uh, making his way through Parliament and getting his charter. However, once he got back, uh, he was in trouble. The charter was in trouble because uh, a man with a lot of influence, uh, William Connington, uh, who wanted his own territory in the Rhode Island area. He wanted the island of that we now call Rhode Island, um, Aquidneck Island. Uh, he went to London 
and he got a charter. He, like I said, he had influence. He had friends, and so he got his charter, uh, which basically took away uh, a Quidnick Island from Rhode Island. So Williams, uh, once again, had to go back. This time, um, 1852, 18, 16. I'm off by a couple centuries. Um, 1652. Uh, it was a very difficult journey. Uh, not so much the trip over, but um, paying for it. Uh, he expected Rhode Island as a government to pay him for these trips on behalf of Rhode Island. Uh, he was, after several years, after his first trip to England, uh, he still had not been fully repaid, and it cost a lot of money. So, to save his colony, uh, he had to mortgage, he had to sell a lot of his belongings to make it there, and he did. And he got his, uh, he got the first one nullified, at least, William Coddington's uh, charter, uh, but his charter needed to be reconfirmed. Uh, but he was safe, at least at the moment. Um, yeah, so it wasn't until 1663 before the, his charter was reconfirmed. He didn't spend all that time there, uh, but yes? Didn't he say earlier that the king should not be able to grant land? Right. So but he had he doing the opposite of what he thinks? No, because he already got the land from the Native Americans. The king was not granting him land. The king was granting him uh, official status as a colony of England. And he did not, um, if land was not part of it, he was not against that. Right, right. So he so believed in the king's rights. It, the king had the right to okay. establish uh, a government from the land that he had already received from the Indians. Mm -hmm. So he was now officially uh, a, a colony of England. Okay. And he didn't see that as being a problem because... Uh, the land was already granted. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Here's Rhode Island. This was the main island at Quidnick. Uh, his first colony was, or first settlement was Providence up here. How many of you are, are really familiar with Rhode Island? Like you've spent time there. So Roger Williams, being the firebrand that he was, uh, could not turn down uh, a good fight. And this is all academic in writing, but uh, John Cotton, uh, among many others uh, who were fighting against the ideas of Roger Williams, mainly along the lines of religious toleration, religious freedom, the civil government, should the civil government punish uh, religious I, uh, thought if someone believes something different than, than the main church. So his, for some reason, I, I don't get this at all, but uh, this book that he came out with, The Bloody Tenant of Persecution, uh, became his most famous work. Whereas personally, I think the uh, the Language of America is a great book. The Bloody Tenet of Persecution is one of the most disorganized, uh, tedious works that you'll ever encounter. Um, I, I, I once thought that if someone felt that they had done something wrong and needed to punish themselves for it, reading Roger Williams' book would be a good choice. <laughs> I have tried reading it. It is painful in the extreme. Even Perry Miller, and I wanted to read this quote from Perry Miller, the great scholar who uh, thoroughly researched and read all of Roger Williams' writings. This is what he has to say. One of the most 
gnarled and incoherent utterances in the English language. <laughs> And pretty much any of the uh, biographers will tell you the same. It's very disorganized. It's almost unreadable, um, tedious in the extreme. The lengths that he goes trying to convince uh, you of his uh, positions, um, it's just painful. And yet, um, that is his most popular work. It became a sensation. People read it. People wanted to know what the arguments were back and forth. John Cotton and Roger Williams, the great titans of this idea, should we punish uh, religious, uh, should we punish people for their thought, what they believed in religion? Um, so yeah, this it consists of a dialogue between, uh, it's between, Peace and truth. And um, I don't know, I, I don't want to go on too much about this, but it was uh, just very difficult to read. Um, so John Cotton answers this uh, work with uh, the bloody tenant washed and made white in the blood of the lamb. John Cotton isn't nearly as tedious as Roger Williams, uh, but he makes even less sense than Roger Williams in his arguments. Um, so essentially, um, I, I, I'm going to condense this um, to what I think is what John Cotton's argument is, and that is, um, so Roger Williams says that uh, you should not punish someone uh, for their conscience. Well, we're not punishing someone for their conscience. After all, if someone believes something that they shouldn't, that goes against um, the Bible, that is anti-Christian, what we do is we consult with them. We confront them. We try to convince them of their error. That's what we do first. And once they have seen the rightness of our cause, when they see how clear it is, from the Bible that what they believe is wrong and, let, and that what we believe is right, then surely they must be convinced. And they're going now against their own conscience if they, can, if they uh, continue with this uh, heretical belief. So they're not going, we're not going against their conscience, they're going against their own conscience. Therefore, it is okay to punish them. You follow all that? Yeah. yeah. And of course, Roger Williams answers back with the bloody tenant, yet more bloody. So here we have this is, it's interesting to see uh, the letters that were used back in those days. This here is a U. Bloody used to be spelled B-L-O-U-D-Y, and it looks like a V. Uh, the S's, I'm not going get, to even get into that, uh, the S's are, the S's look like F's in certain instances, unless it's at the end of the word. There's all kinds of rules that are make the, the, uh, uh, the lettering kind of strange. But anyway, here's the bloody tenant, uh, the bloody tenant washed, and the bloody tenant yet made yet more bloody. Of course, there's two O's here. Anyway. But it was Roger Williams and not John Cotton who was the voice of the future. And even in their own lifetimes, uh, this became evident that in Massachusetts, uh, they were looking more and more like they were the backwards one for uh, persecuting and outlawing things that are uh, should be uh, relegated to the church. So, 1663, King Charles II. We now have the monarchy back again from Oliver Cromwell. I didn't really get into the whole Civil War, uh, which uh, 
had a great influence on what was going on in Massachusetts and the, and the New England states. Uh, but Charles II is now on the throne. Uh, the monarchy has been restored, and he kind of likes the idea of religious toleration in the colonies. And so he grants, uh, not just in the colonies, but he's trying to loosen up in England as well. Part of that was that uh, he wanted, he, he enjoyed Catholicism. He wanted to be, bring uh, Catholics back into England. And so he wanted to tolerate Catholics in England at the time. But anyway, so uh, he allowed for religious toleration in Rhode Island and New Jersey that was established shortly thereafter also uh, had religious toleration, religious freedom in their charter. And then Carolina, by the way, there was at one time only one Carolina, uh, not North and South, uh, but the Carolina charter also included religious freedom. And uh, the, one of the, the great minds on political theory of the day, John Locke, from whom uh, our founding fathers uh, who wrote our Constitution uh, learned a lot. He was one of the great minds that influenced uh, how we run our government today. John Locke uh, published his Letters of Toleration uh, a little bit later on, uh, focusing on uh, the rights of people to believe what they want to believe according to their own conscience. And there's John Locke. Now, you might think that because Williams was really into <coughs> religious freedom, uh, that he would be more tolerant of people who disagreed with him in other aspects. And he was not. He hated the Quakers. And when he opened up his colony to everyone according to whatever, and they could believe whatever they wanted to and hold whatever religious faith they could, the Quakers started coming to Rhode Island in droves. And, and Roger Williams, as I said, hated the Quakers. Um, well, what was it that, uh, about the Quakers that he disliked? Well, just about everything. The Quakers were very much into spiritual things. So things like baptism, things like the Lord's Supper, that could be just spiritualized. So you don't actually get baptized physically. It's an it's a inner baptism. The Lord's Supper is an inner uh, experience. The Bible itself is called into question when uh, God speaks to you with uh, the inner light that everyone has. And so uh, all of those things uh, made Roger Williams just uh, very angry. I mean, all of this was blasphemy as far as he was concerned. And so when George Fox, the founder of the Quakers, came to visit Rhode Island, he really wanted to debate him. He was a little bit too late because George Fox came over, spent a uh, very few months, and then went back again. But he did have a debate with the leaders of uh, the Quaker movement in Rhode Island. A four-day debate. Roger Williams is 69 at this time. 69 is very old back in those days. Roger Williams, uh, his physical ailments were getting worse and worse. Traveling was very difficult for him, but he was not going to pass up an opportunity to convince uh, these uh, heretics, the Quakers, of the errors of their ways. So they had a four-day debate. And this is not a debate where you spend an hour or so talking about the issues. This is an all-day event, four days of this and I'm sure once again it was tedious in the extreme but uh, the people of Rhode Island flocked uh, to these events to see uh, Roger Williams taking on the Quakers 
So he had 14 propositions that he wanted to argue against, and that's what they did. Afterwards, he wrote uh, another famous work, George Fox digged out of his burrows. This was a play on two different names. George Fox, obviously he wanted to make fun of the fact that his name was Fox, but one of his very close collaborators was named uh, Edward Burroughs. So we have the two of them together. George Fox digged out of his burrows. We're coming to the end now. Uh, King Philip's War, 1675, um, was the greatest war per capita uh, that we have ever had. Thousands of people died in a time when there were very, uh, the, the population, uh, of course, was a lot lower. So per capita, more people died in that war in America than any other war by far. Roger Williams tried to prevent it. He was asked a number of times to use his influence at least uh, towards the Narragansetts. This was the Wampanoags uh, of Plymouth colony um, that were going to war. The uh, son of Massasoit, who was called King Philip because he resembled the, uh, the King of Spain, so they called him King Philip. Um, he had had enough. He, is, he could see the writing on the wall. There were too many white people. The English came to take up all of their land, and they would not have any left if they didn't fight. And so he tried to uh, hook up with the Narragansetts to join uh, forces and fight against the whites. Uh, but there was Roger Williams, again, uh, standing between, doing his best to keep that from happening. And he was mostly successful. There were a few Narragansetts who joined with the Wampanoags in the fight, uh, but he was largely successful in keeping them out. Uh, but it, as I said, it was a devastating war. Providence was practically burned to the ground, including Roger Williams' home, uh, which left him pretty much destitute. And he remained so uh, the rest of his life. Uh, his last years, he was deeply impoverished, couldn't even have, he didn't even have enough money for paper. He, there's one of his last letters uh, that exist uh, is him asking for paper from uh, the people of Massachusetts. Um, the last 20 years of his life, at least, uh, he suffered terribly. Now, it's, it's possible that he was uh, something of a, uh, uh, now the words escaping me. Um, thank you, <laughs> hypochondriac, uh, because it's not. It wasn't unusual for him to complain about various ailments throughout his life. <coughs> uh, but they were certainly getting worse and worse as he aged. In one of these, one of these uh, quotes uh, that he made: uh, "Old pains, lamenesses, so that sometimes I have not been able to rise." nor go, nor stand. He was only about 60 when he wrote that. Uh, so, and he lived many years past that. He died uh, 1683 at the age of 82. Um, by this time, uh, he was no longer a famous person. We do not know the exact date that he died. Uh, we do not know the exact cause of his death. There is no one who made any comment at that time. Uh, only comments, we know uh, the last uh, letter that he wrote, and we know that it was mentioned sometime in March that he had passed. So sometime between January and March, he died. Uh, but it was not considered something that was worthy of note, uh, even in Rhode Island. Did he, did he remain married through all this? Yes, he did. And I'm sorry I didn't get into uh, his marriage and the several kids that they had. Um, I usually do that, and for some reason I just kind of didn't get into that. His, his, his wife died just, I think, like five years before this. 
Um, so the last few years of his life, he was a widower. Um, so anyway, uh, but afterwards, uh, he became a great hero uh, to a lot of people, uh, intellectually speaking, because of his uh, very firm stand on the separation of church and state. So he has a number of statues. Of course, he has uh, Roger Williams University in Providence. Um, he has that statue. There's another one. This is Roger Williams and history. You see this figure down here. This is history writing Roger Williams, uh, 1636. Where is that? Uh, this is in Providence, too, I believe. And then you have Roger Williams in Washington, D.C. This is Roger Williams in Geneva. This is, this is called the Reformation Wall. How many of you have been there? Okay. So, uh, great names from the Reformation, and Roger Williams is among them. And then his grave. This is about the worst statue um, of any great person I've ever seen. I don't understand what in the world he's doing. Very stiff with one arm out like this. Um, yeah. But that's his burial site. Um, <clears throat> there's there's a, uh, a story that goes, once he was initially buried, um, the site was lost and people were not really sure exactly where he was buried uh, but they started digging around where they thought he might be is there something you're, you're anticipating yes. Yes. that's what that statue looks like it, it looks like he's already in the tomb oh. and you know, it wasn't quite dead yet no, that's not where I was going. <laughs> so so uh, the story goes that uh, they dug up the site where they believed uh, he was, and they found a few bones, but the, the site was right next to an apple tree. And there was roots all the way through the area where his body should have been. So they saved the roots, and I, I couldn't find a picture, but uh, somewhere the roots that have sucked all the life out of this body and produced this apple tree became somewhat famous. Any, anybody hear that story? No? Yeah. It's, it's not something that you'll often find in a biography, but I have, in one of the biographies, I, I have that, and it's uh, kind of an interesting thing. But anyway, so I'm actually finishing on time today. So, what's that? Envious hand gesture is an Indian greeting or you know peace greeting or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. How long did he stay governor? What's that? How long was he governor? So um, he was actually elected president off and on throughout his lifetime. Uh, the last. I think 20 years or so, he was mostly in retirement. Uh, but it's, again, it's one of those things that, that isn't spoken of uh, as in as detailed a fashion I as I would have liked. But uh, he was, for most of his life, he was the one that everybody went to, whether he was in charge or not. He was the guy that uh, solved the problems, the major issues of the day. But. Uh, he was elected president of Rhode Island, uh, like I said, off and on throughout the years. I didn't understand this idea that you had to be ordained by an apostle. A custom came some 400 years after the life of the apostle. Was this some form of apostolic succession? That's what he was thinking, that um, there had to be an apostolic su succession unbroken for the church to still be in existence according to what he would believe a, a true church would be. And, and when Constantine 
legalized and promoted Christianity, he said that was the worst thing that uh, could ever happen to the church. It became a state religion. Yeah, it became a state religion, and then later on it became an enforced state religion, persecuting those who uh, did not believe, who were not Christians. And so he said the corruption that entered into the church at the time just destroyed the church. Yes? Two questions. One, uh, how many children did he and Mary Bernard or whatever the name was have? I believe it was six, but again, I, uh, that wasn't something that I, I delved into as much okay. as I should normally and, do. And, uh, what did he think of the Nicene Creed? Did he even talk about that? Not that I know of. I, I'm sure he's, he was he familiar with it. Sure. Certainly he was familiar with it, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what he thought about it. Any other questions? All right. So next week, um, William Penn, founder of Pennsylvania.